workshop to order and Ms. Jill Silverboard will be our facilitator today. Well, right. good morning, commissioners. Good morning. Um, nice, to, nice to have an opportunity to sit in Barry's chair since he's, he's out of town. I appreciate it. Um, our first item this morning is a update on the Small Business Enterprise Program. As you know, we, we try to come and greet you every year and give you some, some updates on that. So we have Corey McCaster coming up from Economic Development. Hello, good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm pleased to inform you that uh, we've successfully completed another year of actively involving small businesses in our uh, procurement process. I'm really excited about that. And I want to share with you this morning um, just a little bit about what we're doing, as well as talk a little bit about uh, our performance over the past year. Uh, and then we want to take a quick look at our work plan, if you, if you don't mind. Uh, during the year, um, discussions with internal and external stakeholders brought about ideas of testing the impact of adjusting our program to attract more small businesses. Uh, the goal was to see if opening the program up to all local businesses would boost program participation and increase response to SBE solicitation, public, solicitations published by the county. In only two months, and I, and I tell you, it was quick two months, only in two months uh, the t of testing, the average number of program re registrants have increased beyond the average from last year. And so we're really excited about that. Um, we believe that the changes that we're test piloting uh, will enable uh, a continued increase in the number of SBE program participants. This is primarily because our SBT SBE opportunities are now public facing. Business owners who have not registered with us can now view our bid opportunities and, and announcements. Previously, if small business owners uh, wanted to see uh, what opportunities were available uh, with, for the, with the county, they, they couldn't view them. I mean, it could be because the solicitations were private. Only registered SBEs could see the bids that we have. Um, with the changes that we're testing, all business owners will be able to look at available solicitations in OpenGov and then complete our SBE registrations if they find opportunities that matches their capabilities um, of their companies. And I, I guess I've skipped a, a couple slides. I do apologize. Um, let me go back here. And these are some of the, the changes that we, we have. And as I said before, uh, one of the things that we we see is that opening the, the business opening the program up so that small business owners can be able to see what's going on and what's available in terms of our um, our actual solicitations that are available is 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 key to us. We really think that's going to help the program because before it was a private solicitation and you had to be a registered SBE in order to get the solicitations from the county. And so by opening, uh, opening this up, giving small businesses the opportunity uh, to go in, take a look at the solicitations and what's available, and then deciding if they want to be uh, a part of the program is what the biggest change that we're, we're test piloting right now, is to make sure that all businesses have the opportunity to be able to see what solicitations are available and then be able to participate. Previously, that was not the case, and so we give the, we, we're now giving all businesses the access to be able to look at the solicitations and then respond. Yes, yes, sir. Question, uh, I'm Chair. Later. Commissioner okay. Eggers. Um, yes, so the SBEs are typically smaller businesses and usually go in under our large contracts as subcontractors. Correct. Um, so they, they usually that means they're teaming up with a, a contractor. Yes. So I'm just trying to make sure I understand the mechanism here. So if you could just walk it through based on that premise, that they are a subcontractor, uh, how does this new policy benefit them? Well, I mean, in, in terms of the contractors, with the subcontracting, nothing will change. That's going to, it's going to exactly remain the same. In most cases, what's going to happen is the goods and service opportunities that the county has um, business owners will be able to go in and see, uh, let's say, if we have opportunities to for janitorial contracts. Those things will, if it's under uh, $100,000, those contracts will be made available to small businesses, and then the small businesses can go in and take a look at it. So let's say uh, you own a business, 
and you go in and, and uh, after, after work, um, you want to go in and take a look at what's available, you now have the opportunity to do that. Previously, you had to be registered first in order to receive any of our notices or solicitations. And so you would see that janitorial contract, and then you say, oh, that's a good idea. I think I want to do business with the county. You would go in and register, and then you'll become a small business, and then you could you know, go after that particular contract. Just a, a kind of a way to get more as SBE participants. I think this simply is more eyeballs on, the, uh, on what we have available, on our opportunities. Okay. Uh, they're great opportunities that we have, but just getting more small businesses, taking a look at what we have, shopping with us, and then deciding to do business with us. And most of these would they end up being the contractor themselves, probably. Um, it, it could be. Uh, it could be. Time. Okay, thank you. Appreciate You're welcome. It. I, thank you, Corey. Mm -hmm. um, so, do the bid opportunities um, are they distributed as well through the, some of those subscription services like Demand Star or you know Audio? Or uh, it, all of our opportunities are coming through OpenGov. So if you're a business owner, you would have to go to OpenGov first, yep. uh, take a look at what's, a, you register and then take a look at what's available there. And then if you like, uh, if, as a small business owner, you like what you see, then you would get in touch with economic development, we'll get you registered as an SBE, and then you'll move, move forward in terms of uh, being able to go and respond to one of the bid solicitations. Got it. And, and how do we, how does Pinellas County define an SBE? Uh, SBE is a business that you know, is kind of twofold. Uh, if it's a construction uh, business, $8 million and less than 50 employees. Okay. If you're just a general service business, it's going to be less than 50 employees and then less than $3 million. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Any subcontractors that come under a prime, since that prime has access to what the full RFP is, then that sub will get that information from that prime prior to submittal. Yeah, the, could get that information because that's how they're going to be able to submit their information to the prime in order to complete the project. Uh, correct. And, and we work um, closely with the prime to make sure that when they put a contract or when they respond to a, a contract opportunity and they win it, we and they say, hey, we're going to use uh, uh, companies A, B, C, and D, and they win the, comp I mean, the actual uh, contract, and they say they're going to have those, those businesses available, we make sure that those businesses are getting those opportunities um, in, in, as, they, as the prime outlined in the contract. Yeah, I just want to make sure when um, Commissioner Eggers was asking about the subs to make sure that he also knew that they get that information through that process. Okay. If they're not a direct SBE. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Now, one of the things also I want to cover is, is to kind of rest your mind in that uh, the foundation of the program is not changing at all. Uh, the, the main parts of the program stays intact. Uh, all invitations to quote for SBE still will be uh, in a range of five dollars to $100,000. All businesses you know, who would participate in the program still will need to be in Pinellas, Manatee, Hillsborough, or Pasco County. And all of the businesses who participate in the program will have to be uh, have to meet the actual program eligibility requirements. So there's really the heart of the program is not changing. We're just trying to get more eyes on the program and what what's available. Each year I provide you this historical snapshot, and I, and I do it because it's the best way for me to convey uh, the, the actual changes in the program in terms of awards and payments. As you can see, the awards for fiscal year 2023 have uh, again reached a new program high of $38,489,000. And the team at the office is ecstatic because each year, as you can see, we we're, we're continue to grow in terms of the number of award or contracts that we're providing uh, to small business owners. Also, you can see there that payments made by SBEs have also reached a new high water mark of $27,614,000 in fiscal year 23, almost doubling what was reported in fiscal year 22. Uh, it's wonderful, and for me, I would say it's wonderful to know that this level of county spending remains local, entering the hands of Bay Area entrepreneurs and eventually into the hands and bank accounts of local small, small families. Now, I just got a couple more um, indicators for you in terms uh, of performance. Me. Oh, sorry. Commissioner Eggers. Yes. Uh, 
bids on contracts um, and how if you're a contractor from Hillsborough County versus a contractor from Pasco versus a contractor from Pinellas. Are there, are there incentives if you're a Pinellas County contractor or is it pretty much on even plane? It's on even plan field and it's open to all, all businesses that are, are registered SBE and operate a business within the four counties that I mentioned. Okay. Um, I just want to make sure that because in some some counties have made it you know a little bit unfair I think for our, our folks to bid in their county um, so by by not having that I think it opens it up for those outside counties to hire some of this SBEs here locally I think it would yeah. I mean it would benefit them uh, in getting a contract right it, it, it could it could um, I mean we could definitely you know have a conversation about about your thoughts and see you know what if we can go in some direction like that but I'm, no, I'm fine with that I just want to make sure we're doing all we can to encourage the S, the local SBEs to get business so. and we are I mean and, and the team is out in the community uh, we we make sure in doing our outreach um, that we predominantly focus on Pinellas companies uh, Pinellas County companies. We want to make sure that our companies in in this in the county are getting first, you know, uh, alerts about what's going on and what's available in terms of uh, solicitations that are available. So, my last question: You may not have the answer this morning, but in our surrounding counties, uh, could you get the get us the information that shows um, those competitions that go on in their county for business and how they affect? how our businesses that try to bid there are affected by policies that are set. Yeah, I'm not sure if I would be able to get my hands on that data, but we can take a look and see what we can find. You talk to a couple contractors, they'll, they'll, they'll tell you, I'm sure. Okay. Uh, what, you know, they, I just want to make sure that we're doing what's fair okay. for our contractors. We'll, we'll take a look at that. Thank you. Anyone else? Go ahead. Right. Um, just a few more indicators of performance for you. I just want to make sure uh, that you take a look, if you will, with me uh, at the bottom where you see the average SBE goal. Each of our CIP contracts, our, um, construction contracts that we have, have a goal set on it. This year, the average goal was 14.48 percent, uh, which is a, a, a great number. Uh, for me, I, I'd like to see the number anywhere uh, north of 10 percent or, or higher, and this is a, a good number. Uh, however, when you take that in, in, in comparison to what the actual utilization, meaning when uh, prime contractors decided to use small businesses, uh, we set a goal of 14.48%. They actually used them at 37%. That, that's a 256% uh, uh, increase above or performance above goal, which is a, a, a tremendous thing for us. And we want to continue to see that, uh, that, that growth because Utilizing small businesses is what the program is really all about. Uh, one other thing that uh, I want to leave you with as, as well uh, is, is that our collaborative Pinellas County Small Business Program is the, the, the leader in connecting small businesses throughout the county. Our collaborative is something that we continue to, to, to do and to foster. Uh, this is an opportunity for practitioners that are in this arena, in this area, to come together, share ideas. Uh, give opportunities for events that they may be having so that our small businesses, if they're not doing business with us, they're, they're doing business with a, a one of our partners so that they can be financially healthy and strong. And so, um, so that when we do have opportunities for them, uh, they can you know, continue to respond in a way that satisfies the county. And then this is our work plan for the year. Um, this slide presents the program work, work plan for the year. It illustrates our intent to further expand the program, connect with key partners, and diversify our supply chain through outreaching to veteran, minority, and dis, uh, disabled-owned businesses. Uh, and so we, you know, on, on top of that, we're really, you know, happy uh, that we have a relationship, a growing relationship with Amazon. We think that, you know, in, in the coming months is going to be a great thing, too, as you can see that uh, on our work plan. Uh, with that being said, that's all I have. Any any questions? Commissioner Rodgers. Yeah. Um, so how do we work closely with uh, our current PCCLB to make sure that um, the small business 
employees that we're talking about um, are assisted where they need assistance on issues relating to running a business. And I think about just, you know, my, my thinking is, is that anybody in the PCCLB should be working closely with you guys to make sure that these SBEs uh, get all the help they can in terms of, uh, and, and, not, and not browbeat, so to speak, if there are little issues. In other words, we need to find solutions to problems and not create bigger problems than, than really are there. So I just was curious what the relationship, that, do we have one with the PCCLB, does your office, to make sure that we're protecting our small businesses? Uh, small businesses, one, when you say protecting, I, I'm, I'm assuming you're making sure that they're viable and they're, they, they are strong businesses? There, there, there are, there are uh, uh, yeah, okay. Commissioner, I, I think, uh, good morning. Good morning. Cynthia Johnson, Pinellas County Economic Development. Um, to that point, PCCLB works with us. They provide us a list of all of their new contractors, and what we do with that list is we then try to solicit them to be part of our SBE program. And then uh, PCLB also provides our SBDC information to all of those contractors and say, hey, you can go to the SBDC to help you solidify, sustain your business with services. So Michelle in our office works closely together. And I, I appreciate that. I, I want to make sure that we're doing all we can to help these folks get business. And I just don't want punitive measures that, could, that are maybe not major to get in the way. So we could give like education, warnings, that kind of thing to help these businesses get, because sometimes you get wrapped up in so many local rules and regulations that some of these small businesses just need that extra assistance instead of punitive measures. So. And as part of the program design uh, at your um, guidance and leadership, uh, we created the program with wraparound services. So uh, Corey also manages our Small Business Development Center. So the Small Business Development Center is that mechanism, if you will, that provides that wraparound services to make sure that they can stay solid. Well, if I hear of anything, I'll make sure. Uh, no, I think it's important, so I'll have them reach out to you all, and then maybe you can help out with some of the issues coming from PCCLV. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else from the board? No? All right, thank you. All right, thank you. Next up, <clears throat> commissioners, uh, we have Dr. Cynthia Johnson. She is going to update you on the Young Rainey Star Center Master Plan. Good morning again. Uh, morning. It is absolutely my pleasure to bring to you um, our 96 Acres of Opportunity, which I like to call our Star Center. Um, you have uh, requested that we give you an update, let you kind of know what's going on at the Star Center. So today, I'm going to share with you uh, our latest activities going on at the STAR Center. We're going to talk about our facilities, give you like a brief update on the facilities, the lease summaries, and the things that are happening. The Young Rainy STAR Center um, has been around for quite some time, 67 years that we have been managing that property. And uh, in reviewing the conditions of the property, um, we have found that there are some opportunities to sustain that facility, and there's going to take some reinvestment and some redevelopment to make that happen. So the history of our center is the original building, the one, building 100, which is, let's see, can I use this? Building 100. It, that building has been there 67 years in its present state. We have done much work to maintain that facility, but we're uh, really having a difficult time uh, maintaining it. That facility is not only obsolete, it's very inefficient. Um, we do keep it you know, manageable, it's a safe place, but it has lots of opportunities, which prohibits redevelopment on that site. And so in February of 2019, we decided to uh, take a look at the property. 
and we had colliers to come in and look at the property and say, okay, this is the property. Um, let's see what we can do. What, what can we do with the property to make it uh, a great redevelopment project and then make it an attractor for high wage targeted industry employers. And so we went back and reviewed it. And um, with that, I'm gonna share with you some of the outcomes of the Collier's uh, report that you, one, have heard the entire report, but I just wanna do some highlights. So the County Economic Development Department manages the STAR Center through our, small, through our Economic Development Authority. And we have managed this as a special revenue fund from the beginning. So the utilization and the maintenance of this building is all done through the special revenue fund. We don't use any and have not received any general funding to support the facility as to date. So our ground lease is north of the red line. Right here, you see that? So the ground leases are here. These are the ground leases, 27 acres of ground leases, almost 400,000 square feet. Those 27 acres in this area are not going to be considered part of the redevelopment. So we actually have the remaining 67 acres as a redevelopment opportunity. So the current leases that we have is 490,000 square feet with annual revenues of over $3.8 million that our tenants pay to us. Uh, our average lease is about five years. And currently, we have about 1,700 employees at the Star Center, uh, generating over $154 million in wages for our citizens. We think that with a active redevelopment plan, we have the potential to generate over $462 million for our citizens. So we brought in Colliers. So in 22, when they conducted this study of the site, they reviewed the current conditions and they gave us some suggestions on some next steps and what we should take with the 69 uh, acre portion of the site. And under that we have four scenarios. And of those four scenarios, uh, Collier's recommended scenario number two, to redevelop that site in a public-private partnership utilizing a P3. A review of scenario number two concluded that maintaining building 100 as is, is not feasible. The necessary investment that is required for the upgrades are not sufficient to make the building marketable to attract new uh, clients and it's making it difficult to retain the ones that we have. So a P3 could really be a benefit to uh, not only our tax base, but it could provide an influx of capital, resources for us to sustain the complex and the tenants that we currently have, also giving us an opportunity to reduce the burden on um, the county and help us help our existing tenants grow their footprint in Pinellas County. So reten retention of this building for a build to suit supports not only our citizens in their need for high wage employment opportunities, but it is, it, it is aligned with what we're doing in economic development for competitiveness and competition. We really see this as an epicenter for targeted industry employment and to build on the defense and cybersecurity and manufacturing uh, companies that we currently have at the facility. So with this mindset, um, we agree with uh, Collier's that an, an effective direction to go would be to look at scenario two, uh, doing a P3 partnership. We also laid this over um, our TIL study. And based on our TIL study and how we are looking at um, utilizing our county targeted employment centers, which this would be uh, one, we see that there's an opportunity for another 3.9 million square feet of, uh, of space at this facility if redeveloped properly. 
So we did get the question like, why do you want to do a P3? Why not let the county do it? Why not we make that investment? Well, a P3 is a collaboration between the government and private industry. Often on large infrastructure projects like that 67 acres will be a large, large project for us. But having a private partner with us will help one, they can design it, build it, finance it, operate it, and maintain it. So that then puts the onus on the private industry to come in and be a true partner. And it's a P3 because we get to partner with them through the process and help identify what are the needs of the county and how we can make this work. So this chart really outlines some of the key differences between the conventional project process and the P3 process. So as we have been uh, considering a concept for redeveloping the STAR Center, um, the staff is recommending that, you know, we would like to look at what a concept of redevelopment looks like. And so what we have done is start to work with our internal partners, um, BDRS, Public Works, uh, working with our external partners like Duke Energy and some of our other um, developers to say, what could you imagine this space being? How can we make that happen? So in the process, we are recommending the development of a new utilities corridor being the first thing. That utilities corridor, and I'm gonna show you a picture in a minute, will really help um, position the campus for redevelopment. Whether the redevelopment occurs in the next five years or the next 10 years, this utilities corridor is gonna be paramount to the infrastructure development that we need to do. So the utilities corridor, if you look at the red line at the top here, that's 114. Before we get moving with the 69 acre redevelopment to the bottom here, south of the corridor, we need to prepare the site for redevelopment with the new ut utilities uh, infrastructure. Along the 114th uh, corridor, this utilities corridor would include water, sewer, power, fire system water uh, for the entire campus. A new corridor along 114 would separate building 100 from the site's infrastructure and allow remediation and redevelopment while providing direct building of utilities to each tenant. Currently, we're operating very inefficiently. Staff is manually separating utilities for each tenant because it's all connected. Uh, redevelopment of that corridor will eliminate that uh, manual process. This corridor also restricts those companies that are there from growing because of the capacity. It doesn't have the capacity for growth, and so that then hinders our ability to expand opportunities and attract more companies to the space. So we've been working, uh, as I said earlier, with internal and external partners to look at that infrastructure and to start to say, how can we redesign this corridor to make it effective? We applied for a grant with uh, Duke Energy to see if uh, they would be uh, willing to help us do a feasibility study to see what this concept of redeveloping that corridor could look like. And I'm proud to announce today, on Monday, we did get notice. We got a $135,000 grant from Duke Energy to explore the feasibility of redesigning that corridor to prep that site for redevelopment. And so, as I mentioned earlier, we're not doing any of this in isolation. What we're trying to do is really do the due diligence to create a space and a place that we can all uh, view as an epicenter of opportunity. And so we start working with the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council. And I had the Regional Planning Council, I said, well, 
give me a hypothetical. What if we were able to redevelop this space? What would it look like? And so what they did for us is they took a concept and the green boxes are land leases. Remember the land leases, 27 acres won't be a part of the redevelopment. And so they took that and then the yellow area, the other 67 acres is the opportunity for redevelopment. Once the total redevelopment is, is done, we will have a full campus that is um, seamless and has the right industry in it. So the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council provided us this hypothetical concept of what the Star Center could look like. And if you see, you'll, you'll find that we have uh, an anchor tenant that is currently at the Star Center who's primed perfectly for expansion. We'll be able to provide them that necessary expansion place. We have some opportunity for some new construction. Uh, some of you remember the daycare that used to be along um, Belcher Road that's no longer there. So this is only a hypothetical. This shows new structures and the necessary parking that will be required as well as the stormwater elements that we would have to you know, put into the infrastructure of the building. This is only a hypothetical and this is really just a minimum case of what it could be. The P3, will we would depend on industry to kind of tell us what could this space turn into based on the input that they get from us. So today our goal is really just to provide you an update and then let you know that we're exploring the feasibility of redeveloping this space. We of course will bring back uh, to this board for your guidance on our next steps and what we need to do. But redeveloping the 96 acres here can not only hold promise for Pinellas County citizens, as well as our residents and business community, but what it does is really perfectly position us for one, investment, two, to modernize our facilities and make sure that they're sustainable, and three, create opportunities for high wage jobs for our citizens. So that is my quick update. And of course, Pinellas County will always remain the ideal business climate, and we promote that. And we know that in order to do that, we have to have modern buildings and infrastructure for our, building, for our businesses to grow. So that's my quick update for you. Do you have any questions for me? Thank you, Dr. Johnson, for that very um, innovative and creative new idea concept for the Star Center. I do have a question, if you don't mind, um, mm -hmm. as to whether or not, and you may not know the answer today, but are there any remnants of that contaminated plume under the ground on that property like there used to be several years ago? I have Greg, come on up. Greg is my Star Center director who can ask, answer some of those technical questions. And if he doesn't have the information, we definitely can find out, but I know that we have done um, quite a few studies on the site. Thank you. Hi, good morning. I'm good Craig, morning. I'm director of the Star Center. The, the plume still exists. It goes underneath Building 100 and out into Belcher and Bryan Dairy Road. As part of the concept for redevelopment would be eventually taking Building 100 out, allowing DOE access to that space so they can get into the ground and get to it. And they have estimated about two to three years they would need to be able to make the space clean. Well, I guess my follow-up question then is, are we sure that there are no harmful effects left in that plume for our citizens? It is monitored. We have uh, RSI as a subcontractor for the DOE. They are on site twice a week and they do quarterly, quarterly uh, monitoring of the space. There is nothing that's going to affect citizens at this time that I'm aware of. Good to know. Thank you. Commissioner Eggers? Yeah, thank you uh, for the presentation. So. Um, really what you're doing is you're, you're getting the utility corridor established through just to understand what it's going to take to, to provide the infrastructure for that Correct. future development. Right. Um, you're going to um, 
Is there an element of having um, somebody kind of orchestrate the d different development concepts that will come in? Uh, I think about the access to roads. I think the rail is right there as well. So there is some, I mean, and I don't know what the rail industry is like, especially for mid Pinellas County, but there is rail right there on the, I think it's to the, the to the west. Mm -hmm. So so some so individual companies can come in and get what they want. But is somebody going to be? Are we going to be hiring in the, in your mind somebody to orchestrate the master development there? That's that's the purpose of us wanting to do a P three because as our private partner developer partner start to build the concept. Of course, we will be uh, constantly a part of the initial, um, the, the initial specs, and then they will help us build what industry thinks will attract the targeted industry that we're looking to do and to retain and to grow uh, the companies that are there. And we're going to do it in a very meaningful way so that our existing leaseholders, remember we have those you know, 27 acres, those, those individuals as least impact to them. And then being thoughtful that we have some long-term committed uh, industry partners in the defense industry that are there and want to grow. So we just, you know, we think we have our ideas in our head, but we're gonna take the, the leadership from the P3 partner, but we're gonna also share with them our commitment to, you know, to maintain the companies that we have there. And so we may do some shifting, build a building, move them, and then build them, you know, build them a nice yeah. place and, and put them back in there. Yeah, I think between the Teal study and the, and the group that um, Kathy Wood's organization and the new industries that are going in there um, provide jobs in the future. And they're gonna have requirements that are very different than today. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, this particular plan shows mostly office building and not warehouse and manufacturing. manufacturing. Um, and I guess the least expensive or least risky way would be to do land leases again with businesses that come in and want to do their own thing, uh, as long as it fits within our master development concept that we put together. I mean, yeah. You know, and this is, this is why we are so excited about the opportunity to explore the possibilities, because where else in Pinellas County does the county own, you know, 92 acres of industrial thriving opportunity? And we're right positioned in the middle of the county. This is a fabulous redevelopment opportunity for us. And we get excited thinking about it. But, I, you know, we want to make sure that we are intentional when we do it and we take the time. So that's why we are sharing with you the update because we want to, you know, do our due diligence so that we're not, you know, just haphazardly going by what we think. We want industry experts to make sure that we're doing it in a um, mindful and thoughtful yeah. way. So, so we'll have all of that information put together. Mm -hmm. It's probably you're talking a five to ten year plan. And it, um, it'll all come back before this board. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Scott. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and and thank you very much, Dr. Johnson, for this great presentation. I think it's a it's a a great idea. Um, so what do we think the, the future revenue off of this site would be in five or 10 years when, when, this, when this would be done? And would it still envision operating as a special revenue fund or how would that work with the, with the P3? Well, with the P3, you know, the county will always remain on the, the land. With the P3, we, we want them to build it, fund it, operate it, and maintain it. And so that then becomes um, the, the responsibility of uh, the owner at that time. However, we will get, you know, definitely get the tax revenue for the types of businesses that are in that um, new development. So that's our biggest benefit. And then the jobs that we create for our citizens. So instead of lease, we would get tax revenue instead. Right. And then we will, again, you know, maintain those uh, ground leases that we currently have. Mm -hmm. uh, Commissioner Flowers. Thank you. Um, I know we've talked about this, I think when I first came on board, we just had discussions about the Star Center and um, its age and its relevancy in downtown 
Clearwater and what all was going on around it. So I do support that and truly understand wanting to make sure that the utilities are specific to the entities in there. That is quite tedious and not maybe the best use of staff's time to try to figure out those bills. So I support that wholeheartedly. Um, the only thing I would love for us to keep an eye on, and I'm sure you will, is making sure that we just talked about small businesses inclusion, that making sure that some of those businesses um, have an opportunity to um, have their facilities located within whatever new concept comes about. Because sometimes when we change ownership, if you will, and someone else is taking over that for that day-to-day -day function, um, and, and I understand it really becomes a bottom line issue versus perhaps a um, public interest issue that we have uh, taken as one of our tasks. And um, looking at the CRA that um, uh, Greenwood is doing and how that could possibly tie in for partnerships, um, I think will be critical and crucial with any businesses that go in here um, that may be larger and could partner with some of the smaller businesses for that downtown corridor that uh, Greenwood, uh, the Greenwood CRA is trying to develop. So I just want to make sure that they don't get lost in the sauce when we go through this process. You know, we want the highest and best use and certainly having this facility on the tax rolls would generate revenue for the county that we could then do some other wonderful things within the community. But um, this is like one of the last vestiges of a large site that we have. And just want to make sure that they don't get uh, some of those SBE interests don't get lost because we had the same conversation with the Innovation Center. My question was, how much is it going to be per square foot? Because while it might be OK for some of the mid-sized larger corporations, those smaller companies that we are hoping utilize that space until they can get on their feet or whatever, and maybe get their own storefronts. Um, that cost then becomes prohibitive for them to take advantage. So I know we had that conversation about that facility, so I'm kind of yes. looking at the same for this potential. And Commissioner, um, point well received. And we're, we really are seeking your insight as well. We want to hear what your thoughts are. We want to hear, I want to hear, you know, what, you know, we can all just have our wild dreams about what it could be. But we, we don't know until we start getting in, into to making this cake how it's going to shake out. And so um, please, our office is going to be available. I'm going to be available uh, to hear any ideas, suggestions that you may have so that when we start to put the scope of work together and we start to seek out our P3 partners, that we are very clear from the very beginning that we have expectations as a government entity and our public interest is key to making this development work for all of our citizens. So thank you for that. And I welcome, you know, uh, a sit down and a conversation to further the discussion with any of you. Commissioner okay. Justice. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and I'm trying to make sure I don't duplicate anyone's. The, the 69 acres, um, that's f not, not mentioning maybe the water retention, those kind of issues, but that's, uh, that's fully developable. And I did have some concerns about the, the plume um, that the chair mentioned. And I can, and yes, uh, to, to, to our understanding today, you know, we may have come in and get an assessment and they say it's 69 here and, and, you know, that may change. But from our understanding, we've been talking to public works, we've been talking to different internal county partners to make sure that we were looking at it correctly. And that's kind of what we've come up with. Uh, I can assure you that we have been doing our due diligence in making sure that the facility is not only safe, uh, but to uh, constantly monitor the safeness of it. We have decommissioned some of the, um, the, um, what, the wastewater treatment plants that was off to the, to the north end. We've decommissioned all of those. We are really uh, being as intentional as possible to make sure that the grounds are uh, resilient. And, and we are constantly <laughs> in contact with DOE and they're constantly on our site. And in, the, in my two years as uh, the leader of economic development, we haven't gotten any negative uh, feedback from them and they are pleased with the direction we're going. Yeah, it's, it's, and, and some of it you may not know until you start really 
you know, getting into. I know we're speculating a lot this morning on what this could be, but to, I think it was Commissioner Scott's point, we would hope that a private partner would come in and build, fund the actual construction, that that wouldn't be on us. It would, the, the land is really our contribution to this partnership. Yeah, we, a P3, we don't want to design it, build it, pay for it, <laughs> maintain it, and operate it. But then it would still be owned, the, the building would be owned by them, the property by us, or yeah, what would be, what would land, be traditional? The, the, we, rem, we remain the owner of the land. Okay. Mm -hmm. And who, for those, um, who actually owns the land? It's not like general fund land, it's, ID, it's economic development? Authority. Authority land. Economic development authority. So we, if all of you are the board for the authority. Well, for, let's just, for specul we're just speculating, if we decided we don't want to do any of this, we want to sell it to whoever, that money would not go to the general fund, that money would go into... Uh, now, that, I'm not sure. I'm, 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 I'm not sure on that one. Or if, well, let's, let's take it one more level since we're going to need to get an answer for that one. Okay. Let's say that um, we wanted to have the CVB offices um, own that property, and so would the CVB have to buy it from the EDA? So, okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, they would. And But the first one, we're going to go back and get okay. you that answer, because I'm not sure of that one. Okay, very good. Thank you. Commissioner Scott. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And just to follow up to um, Commissioner Justice's question, what do, we, do we have any idea what the, what the value of that, if we did say we wanted to sell it, what is the value of that land? We, we do not have an idea today of what that value is. Okay. Are we going to do an appraisal just to get an idea what that is? We could if that's a request from the, yeah. from the board. Yeah, I don't kind of think it would be sort of a good answer to know. I think it would be wise yeah. Yeah. Uh, and beneficial in making decisions going forward if we had an idea today yeah. of what the value of that property is. You know, one of our... Um, one of our main objectives is as we look at, you know, live local and the other opportunities across the county and to see that we have an opportunity to preserve this industrial uh, uh, space um, that we kind of control now, um, that is definitely going to be in the forefront of like, how do we keep this as a business uh, employment center? How do we keep it there and not uh, just, you know, sell it to the highest bidder and then lose all of that opportunity? And we have a very, very strong employer um, anchor at that facility that is consolidating nationwide into that facility. They love Pinellas County. Uh, their average jobs are about 120,000. In fact, Greg is working on a contract for them to bring about 100 more employees there to go in the um, in this space where we had um, the uh, Pinellas Licensing Board used to be at the Star Center. So we're working with uh, a tenant, current tenant, to try to expand their footprint into that space. Do we know? Do we know the name of that company? Yes, it's Raytheon. <laughs> Raytheon. Okay. Is our anchor tenant? Our anchor. Commissioner Eggers. Yeah. Um, yeah. This is all. There's a lot of moving parts and a lot of um, issues. Uh, some of them have been brought up today. Um, it's. It really comes down to how much control we want to have of the property so that we can affect the outcome that we envision, um, and that can be. New, new industries that are coming. It can be existing industries. It can be existing tenant that we have that wants to stay there but relocate to a new building. Um, so we have that extreme. And the other one, I mean, you could just sell it outright. We tried to sell the property before and, and didn't get anywhere with the property as is. But I do think the comment that somebody made about one option, getting the price of the land, if we sell it clean, 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 you know, scraped and clean, because that's, those are big costs. Yeah, and, and, you, and, and I can share with you, uh, Commissioner, that when we talked about, you know, us doing it, you know, it's a special revenue fund. I can tell you, Greg doesn't have the money to, <laughs> to, to do that type of cleanup. And to this date, we haven't, you know, using the general funds for that. 
So we're really looking uh, to explore what are the best options that we can bring back to you to say, how can we move forward with that? And all of that information, we are definitely recording and using it as part of our due diligence as our homework to make sure that we bring you back a, a strong uh, proposal. Yeah, I would, I would argue that those kind of costs and understanding that is gonna be critical. So we don't know what the cleanup, estimated cleanup cost will be because if we scrape the land and build new buildings, it has to be cleaned, it has to be infrastructure. It has, those are all costs that somebody has to bear. And maybe it'll be each of the property owners that eventually buy the lots from us, you know, land lease from us or whatever. But there's a lot of possibilities. But having a clean, clean land mm -hmm. uh, is going to be on somebody's tab. And we need to have a, a real sense of what that's going to be, because I think I think that's going to drive a lot of what we end up doing, uh, frankly. Um, it, there may be opportunities yeah, for. Opportunities for that. You know that one of the things I'm going to let Kevin come up and give a couple of comments. But one of the things is that's part, you know, just exploring all of the possibilities. Hi, Kevin Knutson, Assistant County Administrator. I just wanted to comment that the DOE would pay for most of the cleanup there. We would have some infrastructure costs, possibly, especially around the utility quarter, but all of the cleanup of the existing spill would be from the DOE. That's slightly huge. <clears throat> That's a slightly big, big deal to have that covered. So, yeah, so as we look at all the different sure. opportunities, I think uh, it'll be interesting to see the types of facilities and the types of industries and uh, having Raytheon there as a kind of an anchor uh, would be awesome, where you have to build a building for them, move them in there, and then tear it down, kind of phased in and things like that. So it'd be kind of exciting opportunities for us. But I think controlling it is good, controlling the land and, and then leasing it out. Um, you have that control, but the risk associated with development needs to, as you say, be on others. Well, thank you all so much for the time this morning. and. Uh, I trust that you all are as excited as we are about this great opportunity for our community. So thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Jill? Commissioner, um, our third presentation this morning is going to be provided by Curtis Spencer, who's coming to the mic from Parks and Conservation Resources. This is uh, an update to a budget um, exercise that we shared with you when we were preparing the fiscal year 24 budget. Um, this was one of the stress test uh, opportunities that we discussed with you that came out of uh, parks. And so this is really an update um, and, and to be able to answer any questions. But I would preface this with, you know, um, the, the comment that you, you can probably expect to see this again. <laughs> Spencer. Good morning, commissioners, Madam Chair. Um, Jill kind of stole my open there, so uh, it's good to be here with you all today and kind of readdress the beach safety program that was brought up during the budget conversations this year. Um, I've been with the department for almost 20 years uh, in this position for nine, and in that nine years, I've been managing the beach safety program. And um, it's had its ups and downs during that time, but we've hit a point where it really has become a critical conversation to have, not only uh, with our staff, but also with you as the, uh, as the board. So we're gonna step through some information today, uh, try to address any questions um, and, and feedback that you all might have about the program, and then sort of set a path for uh, moving into our budget preparation for FY25. Uh, we operate a beach safety program uh, at Fort DeSoto. Sand Key and Fred Howard Park. It is a seasonal program that runs from mid-April to mid-September. That's based on our uh, restrictions for uh, staffing with temporary employees. Um, the positions are full-time positions, and there's 25 of them, and they are distributed among the three locations. And we operate the program uh, with a general fund budget of approximately $455,000. One of the questions that came up and one of the topics of conversation during the budget uh, meeting was about what's the rest of the county doing? So it was mentioned we have about 36 miles of beach in Pinellas County. City of Clearwater is the only other functioning lifeguard program and they 
uh, work with about a mile and a quarter of beach. And our program uh, that operates under Chapter 130 um, and under the state statute that's noted there uh, manages about two miles of beach, the majority of that being at uh, Fort DeSoto, um, where we, we manage and, and maintain a lifeguard program for the North Beach section of Fort DeSoto. Um, currently, over the last couple of years, we're averaging about 2.5 million visitors uh, during the April and September timeframe. Um, so this is the three beach locations combined. And you can see the stats there uh, in FY23, this, this current year that we just closed out, uh, we had 25 rescues, we had 40, 461 uh, medical assists, and 4,862 uh, outreach opportunities. Um, that total response of 5,348 uh, um, interactions is what our program does. Um, the rescues are self-explanatory. That's, that's actually uh, helping someone in need get out of the water and, and making sure that they uh, safe and comfortable way leave our facility. Um, the medical assist, those are the things that are anything from uh, jellyfish sting, um, stub toe in the water, um, rough housing that turns into something that injures somebody. Um, so that's where our lifeguards step in, whether it's in the water or on the beach, and provide those services, and they work with our EMS folks to uh, uh, address major medical issues. Outreach is all of the rest of the work that they do. Outreach can be um, informing people of water conditions and water hazards. Um, that would be something like helping with lost children. Um, it's anything that can happen on the beach that isn't, isn't that actual medical attention, but are the things that are associated when you bring 2.5 million visitors to a beach uh, year in and year out. Um, so, so I'm, excuse, me. excuse me for interrupting you, but I'm struck by how much higher the outreach number is in 2023 than it was in 2022. Do you have any particular thing that you attribute that to? We did have more guards on staff this season, um, and that makes a difference. We were staffed just slightly higher than we have been in years past, so we did have a little bit stronger presence to provide that outreach. Okay, thank you. Anyone else while we're paused? No? Please continue. Um, to give you an idea, we've put a couple of comparisons together. Um, Manatee and Sarasota uh, counties operate year-round programs, so you can see there their numbers are, are based on a year-round uh, presence. Uh, Pinellas County operating seasonally, our numbers are just a little bit different. Um, you can see Manatee County serves two major locations. Uh, their program ended up with 99 rescues um, last year. Um, Sarasota County, over six locations, had 55 uh, rescues to R23. So you can see the difference there. But when you look at the attendance, Manatee County's year-round attendance is almost what our, or is just a little more than what our seasonal attendance is. Uh, in contrast, Sarasota County's uh, attendance is much higher uh, for their year-round program. So to get at the heart of what we're, we're challenged by, uh, we start talking about staffing. Um, there has been a dramatic shift through the years in the availability and interest in lifeguarding and, and qualified lifeguard uh, in, you know, for staffing. Um, <clears throat> so as our program has changed over the years and the availability of staffing has changed, we've tried different, different things to, to recruit and, and retain uh, good qualified employees. Um, but we're challenged by the turnover. Being a seasonal program, oftentimes we only recruit uh, either um, you know, just out of high school or college students or folks that have other full-time jobs. And so they're only interested in supplementing their income or working on a, on a minimal basis. Um, and so they tend to, to kind of come and go through the season. Um, we have a lack of trained individuals. Uh, we don't tend to get, uh, like we did historically, a lot of folks that come with uh, open water rescue backgrounds. So um, we're fighting uh, in, in the Tampa Bay area between Manatee, Sarasota, and Clearwater uh, for those, those trained individuals um, to get them staffed. 
but our program being seasonal, we are less appealing. Um, and then we have the limitations of the program. We have training issues of our own um, because of that shorter time frame. If you have a less uh, experienced, uh, less knowledgeable individual that you're bringing on, that's requiring more training. We're doing it in a shorter time frame. Um, and because our recruitment during the season actually goes through the first couple of months of the season, um, our aquatic supervisor who, who runs the program is in a constant recruitment and training um, uh, uh, rotation that is not really allowing her to, to oversee the program the way that we would want her to. As a result, over the last several years, we've been at about a 45% coverage of available shifts. So that means there are days where we would normally be operating a full program that we have no one on the beach. Um, we try to do some partial coverage. The issue there is that we really need to have our minimal staffing levels met in order to truly operate the program efficiently and effectively and serve the citizens the way they're supposed to. So if four guards are required to be on the beach and one of them calls out, we're already at a disadvantage. And we've tried to modify what we would do with some um, you know, roaming and, and mobile, that's the outreach piece, uh, safety and outreach, um, but we're still at a, at a very low level in terms of what we would want to present as what we do for staffing. So, Commissioner Peters. Thank you. Um, so, so I've been involved, my, my two sons, and I've said this before, they both started at age 16 and worked at Fort DeSoto, and Stevens worked at others, Chris worked at both other parks too. So. I know we stopped letting, hiring them at 16. I believe it was because they drove, somebody drove over a sunbather on a truck, but we don't use trucks anymore. We use ATVs. So, and I know it's a policy um, now that we only hire 18 year olds, but you know, both my sons were 16 when they were hired at Fort DeSoto. And, and you know, when they, the, when they were recruited, it was in the winter time. It wasn't during the season time. And the county partnered with St. Petersburg and they did all the training, I think at Walter Fuller, because it was a heated pool in the winter time, so that when the springtime came, they were already ready, trained, and, and going. So are we no longer doing that partnership? Um, no, because we're all in competition for the same individuals. Um, so, to your points, the, the shift, and, and unfortunately I, I don't know all the details of why, but we did have that change to 18-year-olds, uh, uh, 18 and older, um, that was done through uh, collaboration with our risk management department. Um, and then part of what has changed is our ability to, uh, when we can actually bring people on. Uh, with the changes that occurred several years ago with the FRS system, um, what, what the real uh, tipping point was, there's a six month window for a temporary employee. So if an employee starts in March and they stay through September, they cross over that six month time period, which means, and, and this is what happened when we were finally made aware of this and how it impacted our staff, the paycheck that those individuals received actually was basically just a reduction and almost zero dollars because the FRS contribution all kicked in after they had been here for six months. So since that time, we've worked to do everything we can to stay in that six month window uh, without expanding liability, but then also look for other opportunities. So we've reached out to, uh, one of the other uh, challenges we tried was to go through the Ronstadt at the time, the temporary staffing agency, to see if they could bring people on earlier, we could pay through that program, and they were unable to recruit anybody. So, um, so we can't do contract? We potentially could, but we've not been successful with the contracts that have been available at this point. So do you, do you think, or is it risk man, do you, Jewel, remember why we no longer wanted 16s? Was it just that one incident or was it something else? I don't, unfortunately, I can't recall why, why we made that change. I mean, I can say there is, you know, once you, put lifeguards on a beach, you do undertake a duty and create liability for yourselves. Um, so I'm sure it probably, I, I would imagine it had something to do with liability issues. Because, um, you know, having them during their high school years, it made sure they came back every time they came home from college. 
Um, and so, so, you know, my sons did it for eight, 10 years. I mean, I want to say eight, 10 years. They were actually Stephen, because he was a paramedic firefighter, he did it even longer. So, um, you know, I'm, I, I kind of went ahead on your presentation and I'm apprehensive about what you're going to say. Uh -oh. <laughs> so um, I'm going to let you finish and then, and then we'll call from there. All right, I'll brace myself. <laughs> So, you know, it, to kind of summarize the challenges that we're having, we, we have this seasonal issue. Uh, we're working with a, a minimal time frame um, that creates all kinds of issues for us. Um, we don't necessarily have all of the resources we would want to have. Uh, when, you, when you operate in a situation like we're operating in right now, you can't maintain uh, the full fleet of, of equipment that you would need. Um, you know, we have what we need to operate, but to to enhance, um, we're, we're short on resources. Uh, the lack of staffing becomes an issue. The higher visitation uh, makes that an even bigger problem. And at the end of the year, we have we feel like we've missed our expectations yet again. And so in the nine years that I've been doing this, basically every October to every February becomes a strategic plan of how can we try and do this differently? And we have... Um, exhausted for the most part, um, unless there is feedback today that, that provides something new and different. Uh, most of the opportunities that we have for addressing this program without additional resources. So it really, it brings us to the reason I'm here and where we will you know, be going, as Jill said, probably uh, uh, in the beginning of the year with the budget conversation, which is the future options. Um, it is a $454,000 general and fund impact. So we do have the option of eliminating the program. Um, it, it reduces the liability, uh, it reduces the funding, and uh, we are not in a legal obligation to, to provide the program, so we are you know, able to, to make that elimination and change. Um, we can look at consolidation. One of the thoughts has been Let's take all of our eggs, put them in one basket, and look at Fort DeSoto as the crown jewel of our park system and put every effort into just staffing Fort DeSoto. Um, it's a slightly lower impact to the general fund because obviously we don't need all 25 positions to staff Fort DeSoto. Um, so we'd be looking at potentially about $180,000 reduction. But it has been become one of our most difficult sites to recruit for. It is as someone said earlier, at the end of the earth uh, in, in the county. Um, so that that's, has its pros and cons. We could modify the program, uh, an approach that hasn't really been a talked about in, in other conversations that I've seen with the board, um, would be a reduction of the program to more of a monitoring program. Um, the state statute that we operate under for beach flags um, has outlined in there how we could um, take our positions, consolidate them, have them stationed at the three beach locations, and they become basically safety and outreach. They provide education on the beach. They help monitor the activities on the beach. They change the flags that are posted for uh, warning visitors of water conditions, and they um, you know, serve as basically ambassadors and, and a fresh set of eyes on the beach at all times. The last option, the more expensive option, would be to enhance the program. It would be to raise the, the funding to an additional million dollars and look at uh, a full-time program that would operate year-round at all three of our locations. This would convert the positions. We would not end up with having 25 positions. We would consolidate that as well, but the cost obviously would go up with, with full-time uh, permanent employees. Um, and then we would focus our efforts for um, any kind of temporary staffing that we did during that swim season. So we could hold a, a bit of that money for bringing in additional people during our busiest times of the year where we still can recruit a handful of people to, to supplement. And then the remainder of the year, we would have a full program uh, operating you know, for, through the weekends and, and the weekdays um, covering our beach locations. Commissioner Peters. Okay, so what does Clearwater do to keep their guards staffing? 
they have moved their program under the uh, fire rescue services, um, and they are a year-round program. So those two things right there have become a big draw uh, for, for um, lifeguards. We've heard from some of our, uh, the handful of returning guards that we have um, that a lot of folks have gone there primarily for those two reasons. Okay, and since FRS was a problem part-time, is that not, if it's part-time, that doesn't account, right, does it? It's the temporary versus part-time. So the temporary employment is the six-month window. Part-time, if you're working part-time, whether it's six months or year-round, it's the, that six-month temporary piece that's the issue. So part-time okay. or full-time. So, so, so you could get a bunch of part-time, it's hard to get them, but it might be hard to get full-time. And since you want all full-time, that's probably our problem. So, you know, well, if you've got a firefighter who's doing it, who's got two full-time jobs, that's hard. But if they can do part-time, because you had stated that they're all full-time positions. Well, they're all funded full-time positions. We do hire them. At, we, do, we take whatever we can get, I assure you. If someone comes and says that they're able to, to do 10 hours in a week, we'll, we'll take that full-time position and make it a part-time position. The full time is the actual dollar amount for the funded positions. But yes, we hire numerous part-time folks. One of the issues that, that challenged us on the part-time side is the, the piece of, of having a minimal staffing level. Um, uh, sometimes with our fire rescue folks, their schedules have varied so dramatically during the weeks that their availability has been like on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then they're the only one that can work that, that shift. So in terms of, of trying to have them partnered with the right number of people to actively function properly and in a safe way, uh, that's where that becomes challenging. Um, but yes, we absolutely bring on, on part-time individuals. Okay, because I know at the firefighters, most of them have done so much, <laughs> they've been required to do so much overtime, uh, especially during COVID, they were doing so much overtime. I've heard that too. That, um, that they wouldn't be available, and quite frankly, with the overtime that they're getting, they don't need the extra income quite the way they used to. Um, so, so I have real concerns about Fort DeSoto, and that's the one I'm most familiar with, so that's my bias. I'm out there. Um, and, and that's mostly where my children worked, but, you know, when you lose a child at Fort DeSoto, that's a really big park that you can lose children, and they lose children on a regular basis, and the way that they organize, I mean, it's incredible how they organize and get on the radio and they find those children before anything horrible happens to them. And so just the lost child alone piece frightens me that, that if we reduce that, that, that piece right there worries me significantly. Um, and I know when my son was working, I don't know how or how, you know, how cars were rolling over at that park, I don't understand, but there were situations where people were driving and somehow rolled their vehicles there, and had those guards not been there, that could have been really tragic. Um, and so, it, you know, I, I don't know how many people drowned this year, and I don't know if we have that data, but it seemed that in the news every week, people were drowning in Pinellas County. Um, and I know, I understand that most of the places they were drowning were Paso Grill and places we don't have guards. Um, but those are 20 some, how many was it? 20, 25 other people that may have died, but we were there to rescue them. And, and in a lot of the cases, it was somebody else going in to rescue somebody and the person that was the rescuer died because they weren't trained and they were just civilians that were helping people. And, um, and so this is kind of close and personal to me. And, and I, I, I would like to see you come up with some other creative ways. And that notion that we can't partner with St. Pete because of the competition, that wasn't a problem back then. You know, they were each, they were each doing the lifeguard training together as a team. Kathy was there, and I don't remember who at the city was there, but they were doing it as a team, and they recruited, and they got, they, they didn't have a problem with it back then. Again, they were using a lot of 16-year-olds, and I think that was smart because they do it through high school, they come back for college. So, you know, if we have to revisit that policy and find out why not 16-year-olds, um, but I, I, I am not in support of eliminating lifeguards at Fort DeSoto. So that's, it's, I, you know, I'm just going to put it out there. I'm a no vote on that one. Um, and I just, I'm not willing to lose. And maybe those 25 weren't at Fort DeSoto, right? So they might have been at San Key. They might have been at other places. Um, but if we eliminate those guards, and with the number of people that drowned this year, and you add on 25 more, 
and and the you know if the visitors keep rising, it could be even more and more and more, and and you know that hurts our tourism too. Um, and I don't want to be known as, as Pinellas County is a place where people come to die. I just you know I'm you know when they're enjoying our beautiful beaches. So I would like us to come up with some other creative ways to to find a solution to this. I mean, we've had to come up with, so we, just, we all have having workforce issues where we can't hire people. And, you know, whether it was salary increases or whatever we've come up with to find out with solutions, we've done it in every other department. I would love to see us come up with a creative solution here. And that's a great point. And, and I, you know, I did, we didn't touch on, but we have, uh, as part of our um, efforts, worked every year and, and through county administration to increase the rates that we pay. Uh, this past year, we paid um, $18 an hour for a new guard, which was the highest in the area. And then there were additional um, increases available for any returning guards or available certifications that they came with. Um, and, and I think your, your points are, are extremely valid. And one of the concerns that we've run into is that what we're talking about right now is just what we cover during part of the year. So those lost child issues, um, those potential drowning issues. Um, when you look at our visitation and then you look at the rest of the year, we have people in the park that have their kids run off and our rangers step in to help them out. We've, uh, particularly Fort DeSoto, worked you know, extremely hard with Tierra Verde Fire Rescue to enhance their response time, have them available in the, the park location during the, the busiest um, weekends along with uh, EMS. Um, so we, we really try to take steps to deal with exactly what your concerns are in terms of citizen safety and, and, and the visitors that are in the park. Um, but yes, we can certainly look at uh, the partnerships, but I do believe part of that challenge is what you mentioned is the, the uh, age. Um, Commissioner Berry has um, challenged us to look at some of those additional considerations. One of the things that uh, Paul and I have discussed is, you know, the, the role of other staff that may be in these parks, um, which is Fort DeSoto's different, right, in that respect. But um, we're, we're going to be looking at anything we can think of, uh, including revisiting the age question. This is um, the, the training piece, for example, open water rescue is different than, you know, the regular pool lifeguards. So that's a bit of a challenge in terms of partnering and, um, and, and the training. I think Clearwater going to um, moving their program into the fire rescue side, which really significantly increased the cost of the program, um, has allowed them to you know be be quite the competitor for us. But um, we're going to be looking at all of those things. You know, again, today we're just trying to get your thoughts, hearing your feedback. If, if, but if we're looking at trying to reduce expenses in the general fund that are not related to the sheriff's department, these are the kinds of things that we're looking at. Mm -hmm. uh, and like I said, you know, we'll be back, but thank you for sharing so, uh, well, your, your concerns. I mean, I do have some other thoughts, though. I mean, what about, you know, it's, we talk about public-private partnerships, but, you know, if the fire department in Clearwater, if that was, you know, first off, firefighters get very little training in water rescue. Um, and now Clearwater is doing more and more, um, and I know that because my son does the training because he's swift water certified, but, but firefighters are not usually the most ideal because that's really not their, they get a very little amount of water rescue in their certification. So, but, but, you know, and I know some Sunstar folks come and, you know, they want the extra stuff, but but why couldn't we partner with St. Pete Beach Fire Department? Why couldn't we partner with mm -hmm. Madeira Beach Fire Department? And that could be a feeder system for them getting new fire recruits yep. that might be interested just like Clearwater's doing. So, you know, I don't see why they can't, I, you know, I, don't, I can't go under it because it's right. their budget or, but there could be some creative ways that this could be some kind of feeder system into new fire recruits. I don't really know if that really works, you know, when well, I say I think, it out loud. But, but I think it's a genesis of an idea. Um, yeah. You know, but, and you're right, though. Most, you know, most firefighters are paramedic, firefighter paramedics. Um, you know, Clearwater rolling this to public safety actually didn't provide them with necessarily a lot of additional backup, but it um, 
provided those employees with uh, a benefit that was consistent with yeah. what they felt they needed. But I think it's a genesis of an idea. Talk to those other um, agencies, particularly the fire rescue. And and I get the year round issue. I get yep. the year round issue. Yep. I really do. But I, you know, me personally, I would like to see you get more creative and try to come up with a solution rather than take that away because that park is so busy. I mean, they all are. San Key is so busy during the season. Um, that I, I think, you know, when you go to, you know, Treasure Island or St. Pete Beach, it's spread out so vastly, unlike Fort DeSoto, that is so packed with people and St. Key is packed with people. And I just think it's, I, I would like to see us keep lifeguards there. Yeah, and, and we can definitely expand on that conversation with the, the municipal offerings because we do have uh, participation in the, the Chiefs Association. Uh, that spans the, the Gulf Coast, and so our aquatic supervisor does work with Madeira and Treasure Island. She's actually, in, in her role, been trying to work with them to do exactly what you're talking about as far as uh, enhancing their training on water rescue because they've got equipment, as you noted, and, and fire personnel that are going out on that equipment, but they don't necessarily have a lot of experience there. So she's been participating with them on that as a trying to foot in the door, have those conversations about uh, recruiting some of their staff and individuals during our season. So that we're definitely underway with that and we'll keep pushing on it. Commissioner Scott. Uh, thank you. Um, I have two thoughts uh, slash questions here. So of the, of the rescues and, and the medicals that we've, that we've had, do we, and we may not know the answer to this question, but do they, is, are those, if somebody needs a Band-Aid or are they 911 calls? Um, do, um, we, do we know? Yes. For, um, for the sake of, of the presentation, they were lumped together, but we do have a breakdown that can certainly be made available for further study. Um, but Sand Key, for example, um, first aid, uh, minor first aid issues, which would be, like you said, a Band-Aid, uh, uh, an ice pack, a uh, uh, hot water bath for a stingray sting. Um, Sand Key had 89 of those incidents. Um, and Howard <laughs> Park had 227, and Fort DeSoto had 70. Um, major medical issues that tend to be things that would also elicit a, a 911 response. Um, there were four of those at Fort DeSoto, nine of those at Howard, and seven of those at Sand Key. So we, we do have a breakdown, um, and uh, we can certainly make that available. The reason I'm asking that question because I'm just if if the program was eliminated, you know, do these then all just just put more pressure somewhere else? Do they turn into 911 calls if we don't have people on the beach to kind of handle these things? So that there's would kind of be a, a concern I would have if we eliminated it if that just puts you know pressure pressure somewhere else. Um, first pressure point would be with our park rangers and the staff, the other staff that are operating in the parks. But yes, potentially the next. Pressure point would be that that increased 911 uh, need. Right. And my next my next thought is since since these are and, and this has probably been thought of thought of before and there's probably a reason it can't happen but I'm going to ask it anyways. Um, since since these positions are clearly tourism supportive, can we use bed tax dollars for that? I, I don't know off the top of my head. We could take a look at it, but my guess would be no. I can tell you that I don't th believe that's true because when we were in the legislature, we made it because North County or North Florida, they needed it for police and fire. And so they passed a law, and I don't remember if it was just for North Florida. Three was it just the three counties? But then we came back and we changed it so you could do infrastructure and other things. So I don't know if the second version was. Mm -hmm. So um, I think TDC would be opposed to that based on conversations I've had and them not wanting to expand their, you know, uh, on other expenses, but um, at least the three counties I know for sure, but I'm not sure if when they did the re next version, I mean, if they included that. It's a that. thought because it's clear, it clearly supports. It's, it's, it is tourism and that's because why. Because it's, it's really bad PR if somebody drowns on the beach. Yeah, it is. So, just a thought. Uh, Paul Kazi, Parks and Conservation Resources Director. But yes, you nailed it, uh, Commissioner Peters. Um, the, the law is currently written because we've we've gone back and forth on this uh, many times about uh, being able to use 
tourist dollars or tourist development money for staffing for beach lifeguards and I think it's Walton, Okaloosa and another county that it's it's Okaloosa, Walton and Bay. And Bay. Um, and I worked there actually when they did it. So those three. Commissioner Lapala. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I have a few questions regarding the modify uh, proposal that you had yes, sir. Um, that I thought was interesting. I assume this would be at all three locations. Yes, sir. Uh, how many positions right. would that be? And would that be permanent the entire time that the, those uh, parks are open? Yes, so we would probably look at um, uh, probably two positions for a uh, Howard, uh, two positions for um, Sand Key, and, and maybe three to four positions for Fort DeSoto. Um, that would, some of that would be budget driven, um, but we would need to, in order to offer that as a full time coverage, we would need to have multiple positions to get through the whole week. Okay. Uh, so we would look at that, that probably about eight total. So there would be somebody on site the entire, uh, multiple people in the entire day. Correct. Um, and to another question that was mentioned, and I, this is not for our tourism brochure, but could you get us stats on the drownings by month in Pinellas County? Is that something that you would have? To, so we could see how many drownings have occurred when a lifeguard was not on duty? We would potentially be able to get that working through emergency services. They, we would have to get that information from them because we don't get the records from any of the other beach locations. So okay. we certainly have our own, but we would need to get that information for you. Okay. Um, the other question that I had, um, I noticed this program was for April through September. So it doesn't really cover um, uh, spring break. If we were to do another proposal, like say the modified proposal, would we be able to adjust the time period to cover spring break so that way if there's not a lifeguard on duty, at least somebody is there during spring break when they're, the population of those areas greatly increased. With the modified option, we were looking at that as a year-round program, so that wouldn't be that wouldn't just cover those seasonal months. Um, so they they would be present during spring break season and you know throughout the year. Uh, Commissioner Flowers and then Commissioner Eggers. Thank you. Um, just a suggestion. Since Eckert College has a very strong marine science and biology program, they have their own boat. There was a jumper from the Skyway once and they actually got called to go out um, to that area. And University of South Florida is expanding its marine science, perhaps. We could touch base with them um, and form some type of partnership. Um, with them for their students since they are stuttering, studying uh, marine biology that may be a, a revenue source for some of those students as well as an opportunity just for us to expand our partnership with them for, for this opportunity. So just thinking about people who already are water focused. Um, and I would have to agree with not cutting back on service if we can't because you, just recently we saw where the riptides you know, got a hold of a family um, and a person went in to save, and I think saved one, and succumbed themselves in trying to do that. Um, I, I know that 16-year-olds, because we use them for our pools, and you know, uh, but that's a more concentrated closed area and whatnot. I'm just a little concerned because the, the beach area is so vast and what could happen out there in the water. It just would take some additional training, and, and I'm sure persons would know how to select a lifeguard who may be 16 or 17 or whatever that is more focused um, and um, more just prepared better probably to do that type of water rescue because that's a large area that you're looking on the people get into groups out there in the beach and some are rough playing and all of that kind of stuff and others are just having fun um, and so things like that happen but um, I know Barry had brought this up to us a couple of weeks a, a couple of meetings ago about how we're not able to have coverage and then putting signs up perhaps that says, you know, th there's no lifeguard on duty, you know, swim at your own risk kind of thing. But um, 
And, and I do appreciate you sharing that it's really not a mandatory thing that we have them out there, but it certainly is a customer friendly, uh, tourist friendly um, type of service that we're providing for those individuals who by no fault of their own, you know, could get caught up into something. So I would love to see us with coverage, even if we need to look at staggering some hours, it may be staggering the, the spatial separations from one tower, one um, rescue tower to the next or whatever, but I would love to see coverage out there because it is important. And then on holidays, oh my, at Fort DeSoto, it's like you can barely walk because you're stepping on the next family that's out there. I know we go out and enjoy ourselves as well out there and it's just a nice place to go. So, um, but yeah, if, um, you know, you may have already thought about that, but I was just thinking that may be a place where we could scoop up some people who are looking to earn a, earn some money and do something that they like doing with the community with the water. That's great. Um, yeah, I'm, a lot of good thoughts around the table. I think uh, I'm thinking of, of, uh, along three lines. Philosophically, we've had a lot of conversation about that today, and I think keeping um, Pinellas, um, the, the messaging out there for our residents, but also for our visitors is uh, come to Pinellas and you have a safe, vacation, you have a safe summer vacation, uh, even when the tourists come in the off season. Uh, so I think that's number one. And if we're, if we're in on that, then I think that's important start. Operationally, the three parks, I, you know, to your point, I think, you know, covering the three parks is important. Exploring all the pilots that we're talking about, you know, we mentioned some of the different rescue units that are down in some of the areas that were these three, these three parks that we would have coverage on. Um, the marina thing that you mentioned, uh, Commissioner Flowers would be interesting. Um, I would also like to explore that year-round thing because I, I know the beaches are crowded in the off in the off season too because we got more tourists here. Um, they may not be dipping their toe in the water as much, but I think they're here. And um, and then the last piece of it's funding. And I would argue that uh, you know we do use funds in the TDC for for uh, for salaries. They're already used big time. There's 40 percent, or no, 60 percent are used for operational costs. Um, I'm, not saying, I'm not saying that uh, Brian Lowack is looking for a new department called <laughs> safe, safe you know, lifeguards and have advertisements on their, on their you know, uniforms to tell people about our beaches. I certainly think that's a very legitimate use of funds and it takes the pressure off our residents on their tax side uh, most of these bed tax monies are used for facilities that our residents can use. They're used for stadiums that our corporate America gets to, to benefit from. Uh, we don't use the monies for parking. I've argued many times we shouldn't have parking fees at our beaches and that they should be funded by the TDC funds. Um, these will be legitimate, uh, important uses of those bed tax monies for our residents and our visitors. Um, and that's something that I'd like to explore. And if it takes legislative action, then I think we need to let our folks know this is one of the number one tourist areas in the state. In the uh, world. It, well, in the yeah, world. I'm thinking about some of those counties that get the benefit of using those funds that way. It would make great argument for that. And um, so anyway, I, I just think that we look on those three fronts that we're ready to, I think we're ready to be creative on all fronts. but not additional tax dollars for the for our residents they already pay enough and these are legitimate ways of attacking a problem in my opinion thank you okay hold on one second because our county attorney has some words of wisdom to share um very quickly looking at the statute and i know that michael's taken a look at it too um he's indicated no we can't use it and i can tell you i've found what appears to be um the governing part of the statute here, which does allow it for public safety services. However, this was clearly drafted with certain counties in mind because you have to have at least three municipalities, you have to have a minimum of, of 10 million in TDT, and you cannot have a population that exceeds 275,000. Clearly drafted with certain counties in mind, we by far exceed the population threshold. Perhaps that's something that could be changed at the state level. But assuming, and I would want to look more into this before we gave you that this is the end all be all answer, but it does appear to be, we far exceed the, thre the population threshold. We got it. What, what's okay. the statute on that, Joe? Uh, it's Sorry, it's 125.04. It's a really long statute. <laughs> okay. um, 
It's not the unincorporated population. Okay. No, it's the total population. It's under subsection <laughs> five, and I'll try to figure out. It's a long statute where okay, it falls. just come back to me sure. uh, when you figure it out, Jewel. In the meantime, um, Commissioner Justice, and then Commissioner Latvala will have the floor. Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, just bottom line is I, I I'm with Commissioner Peter. I don't support uh, eliminating at all. I don't really support modifying or reducing. Um, it is a priority. It is, we talk about public safety all the time. This is part of public safety. And this is one of those areas, Commissioner Eggers, where maybe it's uh, uh, permission and forgiveness, but maybe our CVB needs to hire 50 new hospitality workers that roam our beaches to welcome our visitors. And part of that requirement is that they be specially trained. Right. That's a great idea. Uh, Commissioner Lathala. Thank you. I actually was going to kind of go down that same line. And because um, looking on this, I would think that we would be allowed to hire people through the CBB to do inform to provide information on the beaches as long as it wasn't public safety. And, you know, because our beaches are our number one tourist destination. And so as long as they're not police or firefighters or whatnot. And they worked through, you know, with Brian Lowack. I don't understand what the what the issue would be. Okay, so duly noted, Jill. You can move that forward if you would. Uh, and I would just like to say that I agree with all of the comments made, and I find made, and I find it particularly disturbing that we don't have sufficient coverage during our highest tourism parts of the year. I mean, that is just nuts, because you know with more tourism folks here, they're definitely going to be out on our beaches. So um, I think you've gotten the message today, right? Go forward and do what needs to be done to protect our citizens and our tourists, and especially the little kids that get lost. Yes, ma'am. OK. Thank you. Thank you all. Noted. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, for being here for this riveting discussion today. <laughs> okay, and now we are moving on to our agenda briefing. Jill? Yes, Madam Chair. So for Tuesday, October the 31st, this coming Tuesday, we'll run through the agenda. You have presentations for Veterans Day Proclamation, also for Domestic Violence Awareness Month Proclamation. Um, you have quite a few public hearings. So item number four is a um, case for a future land use map amendment from residential urban to commercial general, 0.19 acres and located at 4685 Park Street. This is in West Lillman. It has a companion zoning item um, that follows and that is item number five. Item number six is a um, land use uh, case, uh, again, from residential sub suburban to residential low. This is for about 2.79 acres, located at 1300 Park Boulevard in unincorporated Seminole. This item also has a companion zoning item that follows, which is item number seven. Question? Commissioner Justice. I don't know what you can tell us today. We have to wait for, but. Has this substantially changed from the last time that we saw this? Do we know? Tom? Morning, Commissioner. Tom Armonte, Assistant uh, County Administrator. Uh, it has. As a matter of fact, we have briefed a few of you commissioners, and between today and tomorrow, we'll be briefing the rest of you. Uh, this item ha actually have a development agreement and an overlaid uh, which uh, provides for some of those items that came up at the last meeting. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Jill? Thank you. Item number eight is um, a public hearing for the ordinance, Chapter 134, which is General and Administrative Provisions, Chapter 138, 
zoning, chapter 154, site plan, or site development, excuse me, right of way improvements, and chapter 158, which is our floodplain management. This is the bundle that we try to bring you for adjustments um, that include tactical as well as uh, housekeeping items. And this will be the second uh, time you've seen it. I believe this is the second of the two required hearings. Um, you saw this earlier in the year and it will be brought back to you. It is recommended uh, unanimously for approval by the LPA. Uh, we have not had anyone appear in opposition to this set of amendments. Uh, question? Commissioner Eggers. Um, um, it, Kevin McAndrew, he usually comes to these meetings, right? I mean, our, our commission. Yeah, meeting. yes, okay. he'll be there on Tuesday. So any effects as to these changes on mm -hmm. development of residential and or commercial, he'd have a handle. That, that's absolutely on, right. On and that. again, that would fall in that tactical category. Yeah. As you know, um, some of these include, uh, you know, uh, our land development regulations, stormwater, mm -hmm. uh, and some of those changes. So it's. Okay, and then real quickly, I missed it. Um, back to number four, is that, what's the current use of that piece of land? Is it, I mean, I, it's, it's not the fire department, is it? Uh, the, the, the fire, okay, all right, thank you. No, so, no it's uh, not the mayor's department. telling me no, so. It's, it's not. <laughs> yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so item number nine is also a public hearing. This is a second public hearing for amendments to our, the, the zoning provisions in chapter 138. Um, and you can see in your outline, you know, the local planning agency unanimously recommended approval, and we've had no one appear in support or opposition. And this is again a periodic update. Item number 10 is petition um, uh, by the Pinellas County Housing Authority to vacate Monroe Court, Washington Drive, and Lincoln Place and Jefferson Circle. Um, these vacations are related to the redevelopment of the property that's located um, over off of Almerton in the Ridgecrest community, uh, Rainbow Village. So um, these vacations uh, are supported by staff and we've had no uh, opposition. Item 11 is also a petition to vacate. Uh, this is related to a vacation of a portion of a 20-foot drainage easement. Um, it relates to um, proposed redevelopment of the property with a new single-family home, and um, staff has no objection to this particular request. Item number 12 is a petition to vacate uh, a property that is located at 607 8th Street, St. Joseph Sound Estates. Um, this petition request does not, uh, does not have staff opposition. Staff recommends approval. It's related to the repair and reconstruction of an existing deck that I believe is already an encroachment. However, um, there has been a change in ownership so we can't pull the item, but we are going to ask you to continue this hearing uh, to December the 12th, 2023, uh, as opposed to this coming Tuesday. Um, and again, that's because of a change in ownership of the property. Item 13 is a variance request from a Kelly Lee McFedrick and Jack Rice um, from the County Code of Ordinances this is related to the docks at 3612 East Maritana Drive, St. Pete Beach. You have seen this case before. Um, I believe it was last year. Uh, this relates to uh, certain nonconformities on the property. Um, there is a significant history. This will be a quasi-judicial hearing. So if you've got any questions, Please let us know. Um, we have our, you know, obviously our staff will be from Water and Navigation. will will be there on Tuesday to present. Um, but it is um, something you've seen before relative to a variance from our provisions limiting the number of single slips for single-family homes. And I'll try to keep it that simple for now. And for clarification, are you saying staff recommends this? No, staff does not recommend uh, the variance. We have suggested a solution 
uh, that would have, uh, we believe, eliminated the, the issue. Uh, the property owners or the petitioners have declined to um, pursue that particular solution. Okay, I'm trying to address the last bullet yeah. point. Yeah. Well, so the last bullet point is if you grant the variant, the first variance, then you're essentially addressing the second, the last bullet. Got it. T typically, the agenda item says quasi or legislative. Uh, typically, it does. Yes, it is quasi judicial, though, correct? Y yes, it is. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner. I didn't realize I was missing. Okay, consent agenda will be items 14 through 29, including your clerk of court and controller items, miscellaneous items for filing. You have the county administrator's uh, non-procurement delegated log. And then we move to item 24, which is on the consent agenda. This is ranking of firms in agreement with Kim Hornley. Kim, Kim Hornley, sorry. <laughs> Kimley Horn, I do that when I get tired. Uh, this is related to engineering services for our septic to sewer ARPA project. Um, and uh, the funding is provided uh, from that source for this contract. Under 25, that's your monthly uh, list of receipt and file cases that have been served upon the county. There's one case there that we've received and we'll be defending. Item 26 is a resolution adopting and approving the fiscal year 22-23 general fund and housing trust fund budget amendments that have been approved by the Housing Finance Authority Board of Directors. There are no county general funds involved and this is um, an, an annual housekeeping matter. 27, Housing Finance Authority resolution. Uh, adopting the fiscal year 23-24 general fund, exactly like the previous item, just different fiscal year, um, and we are recommending approval. Item 28 is a receipt and file report of the Law Enforcement Trust Fund for the quarter ending September 30th. This is under the Sheriff's Office. Item 29, similarly, receipt and file report, of Sheriff's Office grants received and service contracts for the quarter ending September 30th, 2023. So that's your consent agenda, regular agenda. First item, uh, number 30, economic development. Um, this is an application for a funding modification under the Penny for Pinellas Employment Sites Program. Um, it relates to a, um, existing approval for national doors and hardwares uh, conditions that you placed back in May um, and the applicant is asking for a modification. I Staff has objections or no objections? Let me just verify that with Kevin real quick. Hi, Kevin Knutson, Assistant County Administrator. No, we don't have any objections. They're actually asking for a reduction in the funding. Okay. okay. Looks like, yeah. Great. We're Thank okay you, Kevin. And the item would include delegation of authority to the county administrator to go ahead and make that change. Item 31 is the 2023 statewide mutual aid agreement with the state of Florida Department of Emergency Management. Item 32 is Affordable Housing Program project funding recommendation for Long Lake Preserves. This is a townhome project by Habitat for Humanity. Um, and it is recommended for your approval as outlined in the backup. The funding is from our Penny for Pinellas. Our portion of the funding is from our Penny for Pinellas um, Affordable Housing Program. Uh, Oh, sorry, Commissioner Eggers. Thought I hit it. Sorry, the uh, the housing uh, portion of the penny. How much funding we were estimated to have, and how much we will have spent. Just yes, and I don't know it off the top of my head, Commissioner, but it should be in the staff report. It should in, be in the, in the staff report. Okay, thank yeah. you. 
And if not, I'll have Tom get it to you this okay. afternoon. Chris is saying it's in the staff report. Okay, thank you. 33 is uh, affordable housing program project funding uh, recommendation for Fairfield Avenue Apartments. Um, this project is for, let's see, uh, it's a combination of units, 264 multifamily units at uh, 3300 Fairfield Avenue South in St. Petersburg. I think you, most of you are probably familiar with this particular application. It is a combination of households. Um, there's 53 units earning less than 50% AMI, 67 earning less than 80, and the remaining 144 units are for households earning less than 120% AMI, that workforce um, category. And your funding source, um, of course, is your, is your penny, for our portion, is the penny affordable housing program. What, what fiscal year is that in? Um, the application came in in 23, but the funding will actually be reflected as um, in, incur, uh, encumbered in 24. But because it's a penny program, it, it's not a, yeah, it's not yeah, doesn't, doesn't matter that much since it's capital. 34, uh, contract with State of Florida Department of Health for the operation of the Florida Department of Health in Pinellas County. It's an annual housekeeping item. Madam Chair, I'm Mr. Sorry. back to that one item about the tracking of the projects. Mm -hmm. I just I did look it up, and it's showing how we're doing every year. Uh, I, I'm not seeing on here what the, the total estimated amount that the eight uh, half of the 8.3 percent set aside would be, and it might be here that I'm, I'm just missing it. So I'd just like to have a sense of what the estimated amount is. I see what we're spending, so right. it'll just give me an idea. Right. But you want the projection? Yeah. 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 Thank okay. you. We'll get you that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Item 35 is permission to assign the registration number and release the number from the existing Mosquito Control Helicopter to the new helicopter that we hope will arrive next month. Um, no idea why it, it's required, but apparently it's a statutory thing. It must be approved by you to, to change the make the request to uh, sign it over to the new vehicle. Item 36 is a resolution declaring a portion of county-owned property at 134th Avenue North as right-of-way. This property is being used as right-of-way. It's owned in fee, and this is um, housekeeping to actually um, change it to what it's being used for, which is right-of-way. Does <clears throat> requires a resolution no, it does not. Yes, it does require a resolution. And this is a specific piece of property? It, it is. And it doesn't it's, show um, on the map, on the location it, map. I know. The location map gives you like one arrow to... I don't even see it. We, we, I, I'll get you okay. a better exhibit so you, so you okay. can see. Um, it is, it's not a very large okay. uh, piece of land, but we'll get you that. Thank you. Item 37 is from uh, BTS. This is a third amendment to purchase authorization agreements with SHI International Corp and CDW Government LLC for technology solutions and services. This particular item is related to uh, increasing uh, the purchase authorization that already exists with these particular vendors. Um, it is an increase of 2.1 million uh, that's split between those two vendors. 1.1 goes to SHI and one, go, 1 million goes to CDW uh, for a revised total not to exceed amount of 11.5 million. I just take an opportunity to just throw something out of uh, frustration. It, and it usually comes with the uh, BTS dollars, because mm -hmm. it always seems like we are, you know, and, and there are some of the commissioners that sit on the board, so they're a little bit more up to speed on it, but it just seems like it just is a, a bottomless pit that keeps growing um, almost, not exponentially, but so I don't, I'm not sure how we get our arms around it if we're not on the board, obviously, and that's I'm not saying that I want to be on the board, but it's just a, a, somehow get a, a sense of where these funds are going and in, in big buckets. In a, and, in a comprehensive yeah, yeah, look. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, 
Maybe it's a one-on-one, -on -one, maybe if nobody else well, has that. I'll, I'll talk with Jeff Roars yeah. and, and see. Thank you. See what to that thinks. point, may I just weigh in that yes. if you just consider with your own, well, not the counties, because the county is, was, but if you own your own iPad or your own iPhone, it's the continuous advances in technology that our system requires us to stay up to date on in order to provide us with everything we need to make intelligent decisions. You had something to add I, in? I did that? too. So the last meeting, um, I think I was the only one there from this board that was in attendance, but um, they gave us examples of AI and how AI is moving and, um, and did a great uh, example on how very quickly just using one sound snippet of Ken Burke was able to do a whole speech of Ken Burke that wasn't Ken Burke. And same thing with photographs. And so as uh, AI comes in, we have to be prepared to protect our, you know, our systems as new technologies come in. And, and, if, and unfortunately, when we're having increase in costs, it's highly likely it's more inflationary on some things. But um, the technology that keeps moving exponentially to keep up with it is incredible. Um, but I'll tell you, it was frightening to see what they could do um, because, you know, all you have to do is say yes on your phone when someone calls and they get your voice. But they, you know, your voice message that you leave, they can use that voice message to use that and they can make any kind of thing out there with AI making you make statements with your voice, with your face, and very soon be able to do videos that you had nothing to do with. Um, and it's really kind of frightening. Um, especially since our voices are available on air mm -hmm. to access any time, as well as our, our facial features, that, um, that people can start making videos of us that we have no idea they're doing. And it's our voice and our face, and it's frightening. And so a lot of the new technologies, what's great about being on that board is you get to see the emerging technologies that are coming out that maybe we're not as familiar with. So. Um, I know it's frustrating that it is a bottomless pit, but it seems to be an essential thing that we have to stay on track and on target because if we're not, um, bad consequences can happen. So Commissioner Peters, based on that information, and thank you for it, because I'm very aware of how artificial intelligence is going to change almost everything we do. I think it might behoove us in order to make an intelligent decisions going forward if we ask Jeff to come in and make a short presentation to the entire board sure. so we are all up to date with some of the quote unquote frightening and unbelievable things that are going on because the last thing in the world we need is somebody out there making another you or me or David or Chris especially. <laughs> especially. <laughs> Think about wow. what the world might look like with that, <laughs> right? It would be frightening, but not just Chris. It'd be like, well, like any of us, seriously. <laughs> okay, so thank you for that little moment of. I'll yeah. follow up. I'll follow well, up with Jeff you. Roars and thank and, you. and try to get some time that you well, can I mean, it's, have whether, an yeah. overview. Yeah, it, it affects us here. It affects yep. the, 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 the the courthouses and the jail and the uh, and, yeah, you everything. Know, it's it's huge dollars. So anyway, it is big you. dollars yeah. and, you know, cloud services, subscription services, yeah. you know, you've understood the trajectory of that, I know, and, yeah. and we'll get, we'll get you, uh, we'll get Jeff in yeah. here. Not implying that we're wasting. I'm just Understand. more for understanding so that I can tell whether we're wasting. <laughs> Go ahead. And, Go ahead. and by the way, you're not a, a subject matter expert on this Correct. issue, so it'd be hard for you to tell whether or not it's wasteful or not. Because once you move into a new technology with a new software system, now you're tied to making sure that it is up to date and current, hence the rising cost. And I know you want to laugh. No, I said information is power, so that's why I wanted to learn more. Well, there so you go. Then I can be a, more of an. It's so good matter. when we're on the same page, Commissioner Eggers. Okay, okay moving item on. 38. <laughs> You'll be sit sitting as the Fire Protection Authority. This is an agreement with City of St. Pete 
St. Petersburg for fire protection services in High Point and, uh, excuse me, Gandy and the High Point East Fire uh, Districts. Right now, I believe you have individual agreements uh, with the city for each location. This agreement would actually just bring those together since it's still the same agency, City of St. Petersburg, providing the services. Um, there's no change in the coverage areas. Um, and it is proposed to be a five-year agreement um, you have in your adopted fiscal year 24 budget provided for the funding to pay the city of St. Petersburg for these services. I have a question. Commissioner, <coughs> excuse me, Commissioner Peters. Um, so does this go out to bid? I mean, because, you know, Pinellas Park is adjacent just as much as St. Pete is. And so I don't know how long they've had this contract and have we ever considered putting that, I mean, we put other things out to bid. Um, but, you know, both of those areas, Pinellas Park is also adjacent to, and mm -hmm. so I'm just curious why it's St. Pete and not Pinellas Park. And so how long have they had that contract and has it been out for a really long time? You know, they had it for 15 to 20 years. Has it been five years? Got it. Uh, Commissioner, we'll, we'll get you those answers and we'll have them for you before Tuesday. County attorney reports. Um, I don't, <clears throat> I don't, do not anticipate having any reports on Tuesday. Um, however, I will say I forwarded each of you by email a new lawsuit that's been filed against the county this week. Um, I do have regular meetings set with some of you, but not all of you. For those of you that don't have regular meetings with me, if you wish to discuss or hear about it or ask questions, let me know and we'll set up a time to talk to you. Any administrative reports? Commissioner, I have no idea if Barry's going to have a report for you on <laughs> well, Tuesday. Well, he better. He's but been I'm going to go with yes. I feel pretty certain that he will. Um, Perfect. Yes. Thank you. So let's plan on one. And County Commission new business. I don't know if anything has anybody has anything they want to discuss today or wait till Tuesday. Yes. I have some new business that will come up. Our YAC group met yesterday. So they did their elections. Uh, they, we now have a new chair, new vice chair, new secretary. Um, so the new chair is Juds, Judson Van. Vice chair is Alexandria Gooden. The secretary is Nisa Dahimi. I think I said her last name wrong. Uh, and we will, um, and the Parks and Recreation, they have appointed Jacob Cox. So um, I need to have that uh, voted on at the next meeting on Tuesday that Joseph Cox be appointed to the Parks and Rec Board. Um, because they just did it yesterday, I don't have time to wait for another month because we want him to uh, be engaged in that board right away. Um, and since they're in school, it's, they usually don't always get, they, they try to attend 12 months, but they've missed some, so, so that's why. Also, um, we have had um, three more students um, have uh, applied to join uh, YAC, and since we had a low turnout this year, uh, the, um, the committee has voted to allow them to come on, but it has to come before the BCC for it to be official. There will be a fourth one coming next, uh, next month, but um, right now it's Madeline, Madeline Wah, um, Cash Reese and Joseph Wen uh, would like to join WAC, uh, YAC, and we need um, those. I'll ask for a vote on Tuesday. So on to Tuesday, include them. excuse me, but on Tuesday, when you bring, have that before us, can you also let us know the different schools that they're coming from? We can absolutely let you know what schools. I think that would be a good piece yeah, of information. Yeah, it was much, and I think last year we had 35, and this is only gonna bring us up to like 22. So, so we had a real decline this year, um, but I'm glad to see more students are saying, oh, I missed it, I wanna get on it. So we're encouraging yeah. them to, to come on. But yes, we'll get the schools for you. Um, but so Jason Cox um, for the um, Parks and uh, Conservation uh, Board, and then um, the three new uh, students that want to join YAC will be um, I, under new business on Tuesday. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Commissioner Flowers? Um, for the rest of my report, I'll wait until um, board meeting, but I just wanted to share a quick update related to career source. Um, we are getting closer to the um, 
transitioning of Career Source, uh, Pinellas and Hillsboro. Um, Steve Meyer and I met, because um, I can't talk to Kevin. Kevin's also on the board, so we have a sunshine conflict. But Steve Meyer and I met, um, and we talked about some of the minutia things, but one of the most critical things that I would like for you to consider, uh, Madam Chair, is um, the transition committee will need to have two commissioners, two from Pinellas, two from Hillsboro, to serve on that transition team. And then there'll be representatives from our actual board that the board will vote who those people will be um, in order to assure that all of the processes, financial, um, down to equipment leases, everything, so that all of that is taken into consideration through the transition. Where will the main facility be? Where will the satellite facilities be? Hiring of staff, all of that. So it's gonna take a lot of work. So um, I am asking that um, you consider uh, reappointing me to that because um, I've been a part of the phone calls from the very beginning. I have um, certainly served on the Career Source Committee and serving as vice chair. Um, have been interviewed by the team from Tallahassee and just have been intricately involved in the transition process. Um, and then you select whomever the other person would be, but I wanted to bring that up because that is something that needs to happen fairly quickly so that um, the person or persons will be in place for the next scheduled meeting. Um, and then there's a, a, a there will be a Zoom call, I believe next week. So just wanted to put that out because I think that's something that's urgent and timely for, for this body to make a decision on. Thank Kevin, you. I don't know if you want to add anything. Kevin, um, just for edification, Kevin has already briefed me on that entire oh. issue. We've had yeah, quite I a can't lengthy talk to conversation. <laughs> so yep. I and to. Uh, I, am, I will be prepared. On Tuesday, Kevin, is it Tuesday that you want me to make the appointment? Uh, Kevin Knutson, Assistant County Administrator. No, ma'am. Well, we'd like to wait until after you actually establish the consortium on the 14th. Oh, okay, great. After that point. Um, we haven't briefed everyone. We have two more meetings to go, and then everyone on the on the commission will have been briefed. Okay, thank you. Okay, did you have something, Commissioner? Oh, I um, I was going to just say that I wanted to express my interest of serving on that board because I'd been briefed about that. But if we're waiting, then I will wait too. But okay. just remember, I as the education chair. I was the education and employment chair. I am until I very to... much aware, what? Commissioner Lavalla. <laughs> Don't and, and worry. And you look very nice today, Madam Chair. Thank <laughs> you. And she did not pay him to say that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Oh, brother. Anything else for the good of the order? Okay, then we are adjourned. <laughs>